it's going to play out. It's going to be really going to be on a nation to nation basis because because of, of you know what each each country has to offer. But make no mistake, you know there's no policeman in the world anymore. Everything is all wild wild west. Thursday, April twentieth, two thousand twenty three, Monaco sixty four home of alternative economics and contrarian views. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with John Lee. He's the CEO and executive chairman of Silver Elephant Mining. Uh, John, nice to have you back again. How are you? Great to be back, Mario. It seemed like yesterday, but then a flash of an eye, it's been six months. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we spoke uh, on October 30th, 2022. And at the time, you said that the elites were suppressing the paper gold price while backing up the truck with physical. And you certainly uh, seem to have been right because we, we've we seen from the World Gold Council that uh, central banks, especially those not in the West, accumulated the most gold, net gold, uh, in, re in recorded uh, data from the World Gold Council in 2022. And today, as we speak, Gold uh, is up about 21%. Uh, it was around 1650. Right now, we're just above 2000. And silver yep. is up 31%. It was at 1925, and we're now just above 25. So, how do you see things progressing uh, in, in the precious metals market, but also maybe in the economy and the geopolitical situation? Right, Mario, I, you know, I came on your show and I, I said that the worst is over for gold and silver. And um, you know, I will not put too much emphasis or I will not put too much um, weight into the reported gold purchases. These are all government figures. And if you don't believe their CPI numbers, if, they don't believe, if you don't believe their inflation numbers or employment numbers, uh, why why would you cherry picking on things like because <laughs> because they are reporting in your favor and somehow you take them as Bible. However, I don't think there's any question that uh, central banks and the in elite individuals are buying gold uh, for the biggest reason, as we men mentioned six months ago, is that diversification of central bank holding and the change in the political landscape that happens not only once or two once in a decade or two, but once in a generation. And that the dollar of uh, the 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 Bretton Woods, of course, and the standardizing of the dollar's as global reserve is only a marriage of of convenience, and the and the and the sort of the the uh, today is very different from back in the seventies in terms of the Saudis buying gold, sorry, by uh, uh, selling oil to United States, and now they don't do that anymore, and and also sort of the alliance and, and the, the the United States playing the statesman of the world, but that is broken down as well. And what we talked about really come to fruition uh, in the last six months as we see the BRICS, not only the Chinese and the, and the Russians are, are sort of forging, forging a unified front, but, but you have the South Americans and the, and the Indians and, and uh, whatnot, they're all in the Saudi Arabia, all come to, all banded together and, uh, you know, uh, sort of voicing their displeasure on how the world is governed. And I think we're going to see a lot of other uh, uh, interesting developments and, and situations is going to accelerate um, this division of the world. I think really quickly also that Mario, I believe I came on your show. I've been doing a couple of shows recently that you know we packed the gold the target of about the two thousand and then silver breaking on the twenty eight. I thought that would have probably happened like in September. <laughs> um, People, I think, you know, reading some of your comments uh, in the comment section, the, some of the people call me, call me loonies when gold is 1600 and say, you know, gold is going to take out 2000. And lo and behold, I am, uh, you know, I think right now we're at a 50 50 juncture because the dollar, like we talked about, uh, when I thought it was 110 or 112, when I was on your show, I said it's going to oscillate at the 100 to 110 range. And now we're at the bottom of that uh, consolidation range where gold is at that near all time high. I'm not sure if 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 uh, gold is going to take a crack at it on, on this try this time because the dollar may stay to rally after such a big correction in in such a short period of time. However, it is not a high confidence uh, prediction. Certainly, if you have a trader, it's, it's a good idea to take a bit of it off the table as you're hitting that resistance and dollar hitting the support. But you got to keep that core position. I think that's overall. We can talk about equities and bricks and 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 and, and other things. 
I agree with you. Uh, if you're a trader, it does uh, feel like we could see further uh, pressure here, uh, just above 2,000. But yes, if you are a stacker and you hold physical gold and silver, uh, I, I think, yeah, in the short and medium term, you will see volatility in the price. But in the long term, I, I've looked at some charts. Uh, there's a good website, FX Top. You can reverse uh, the uh the chart, chart. Okay, yeah, yeah. By putting actually by putting the uh, dollar first and gold second, and all the fiat currencies, they've lost like over ninety percent in the last fifty years versus gold. Okay. So long term, I think that's going to continue. And uh, yes, last year, of course, uh, Russia and Ukraine was a very important topic uh, to, uh, for commodities, for 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 currencies uh, in terms of geopolitics. But it seems to be, you know, becoming less important. I think the Russians have proved that uh, they've been able to withstand um, the uh, pressure from the West. And uh, there's been a huge move as well by the BRICS. We knew already then that the BRICS wanted to have a multipolar world, but it's really accelerated. Like on December 7th, we saw the Saudis and the Chinese meeting and talking yes. and also the golf cooperation. Uh, yes. So, uh, and then recently we saw that Brazil and China said they're going to deal in their own currencies. So, but there's still a lot of people out there uh, that seem to think uh, the dollar will remain king and uh, maybe as a currency to trade, but even then uh, I, I'm not too convinced. What What's your view on that? They, they seem to me to be a little bit in denial. Yeah, um, Minago 64, the dollar, I think gold is gonna, gold, it will break out of that inverse relationship with the dollar. A uh, dollar is fiat, but the other G7 or G8 currencies are subordinated to the dollar. And uh, I, I think we, I was on your show, I think everything, all the pretty much the same, the pound, the euro, and they're just playing this. I think what the uh, the, the cartels and the managers of the governor, governors of the governments are, it's almost like want, they want to trick into uh, sort of people uh, uh, not paying too much attention to gold by 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 staging the dollar up and down and try to keep people in that game of currency arbitrage. But I am not I'm not any bit bullish of the I'm not very bullish of the pound like I'm very bullish of the dollar. I think they're all much the same. Uh, one thing you talked about. Remember about back in the days, maybe five, seven years ago, when North Korea fired a rocket and gold would be up $30. Uh, the the uh, Ukraine-Russian war is not going away and it's not diminishing. Uh, the, the significance is not diminishing. It's just it's because the media is not reporting about it. But you still have billions of dollars worth of weapons and arms that are going into it. Thousands of people are dying on a daily basis. Hundreds of you know, hundreds or thousands of people are dying on a daily basis. It's not going away. However, like we said before, people asking me when that war is going to end. And, and my answer is, when is the next one going to start? And I think it's becoming increasingly clear that the war is only a pretense for a change of regime. And uh, and nothing is going to, and, and, you know, Zelensky has made clear that they're not going to negotiate with the terrorists, the Putin and and uh, we also talked about the Xi Jinping being post greatest threat to democracy. And I don't think we're, there's going to be any letdown until there's a regime change. And for the reflection, I just want to clear some of my thoughts are this is not this is not an East versus West. And this is not even a philosophical democracy versus dictatorial. These are the two sides of the same coin. What's happening is it's clear for all to see that Biden is not calling the shots and people are calling the shots are. The same people that uh, started the Opium War in the 1800s, the, the same people that uh, that uh, disintegrated USSR in the early, early 90s, and then and then in turns then ransacked the the uh, all the looter like all the treasures from China to 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 London and and all the oil to Exxon Mobil's and and Chevron's. Uh, maybe it's not the same people. Maybe their grandchildren, right, or the children. But the, the storylines are the same. So what you have is people are waking up to it and, and the Brazilians and the Indians and the Turkish and the Russians and the, and the Chinese, we're not going to put up this, we're going to repudiate, we're not going to be putting up with 
this movie, like remember that movie, a three hundred or one hundred? You have the the giant guy descending on, and then you know. So this is exactly where we're at, and exact. And then how it's going to play out is going to be really going to be on a nation to nation basis because because of, of you know what each each country has to offer. But make no mistake. You know, there's no policeman in the world anymore. Everything is all wild, wild west, up, up for grab. And the situation is not going to be uh, any easier. And answer your question, the, the dollar is going to still be the king of fiat, but the real gain to be had is in the precious metals space. And also in some of the emerging market, as they start decoupling from the dollar standards uh, that are breaking away from the dollar. Uh, one last quick note, uh, uh, just another observation and comments, and we, I talked about in other shows, is just because all the BRICS nations have a common enemy in just the dollar or sort of repudiating what the United States brown knows into their business, just because they have a common enemy per se, doesn't mean they're friends, okay? <laughs> they all have a long history, and this is not like the Eurozone, you know, kind of at the same time zone, you cross the border, have a dinner, and, and you have the same sort of governments and, and easy to get a unified currency. But even in that regard, right, uh, you have the you have the Spaniards and the Greeks and Italians are reaching their debt ceilings and you know and a lot of quarrels. In the case of Russians, and you know, I don't think they're gonna get standardized on what time they're gonna hold those meetings, whether it's nine o'clock Russian time or 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 four o'clock, four o'clock Indian time, not to mention the language difference, the cultural barriers, who's gonna set this unified currency interest rates. And rest assured, you know, these guys are almost Victoria prima donnas. They're not going to, they're going to, they're not going to, they're going to, they're not going to take it, you know, take the Renmin B printed at the backyard of Beijing's uh, Xi Jinping's back pocket and, and, and be happy taking too much of it. I would not be surprised if they, obviously, if you have two nations that are trade, trade, trade numbers are close to equal, then you're not really making, you're not really reserving any currency per se. But I'm sure over the course of six over the months and maybe a year, a couple of years to come, when you're getting too much Chinese currency, for example, what is to stop from China exerting the same sort of pressure on the SWIFT system? That's what United States is doing. And you know, let's, let's be clear about the motives, okay? So it's just, it, this, is, this arrangement is gonna be just, a, a, again, arrangement of convenience, it's gonna be broken down very, very quickly. And in the end, Minago 64 is going to be like Charles de Gaulle taking the currency exchange for gold when it's not there. It's how much, however much gold you have in your vault, and you can you can then do that much trade. It really is going to boil down to this in the end. Yeah, what what it seems to me is that it will uh, discipline countries because if they don't have the gold, their currency is going to go down the down the chute. And uh, it's interesting that you go back to the uh, opium wars because. Yes, there's a lot that's happened in the last 200 years. Uh, I've heard as well about the fact that uh, the last Chinese emperor, uh, a lot of the the gold from 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 that dynasty was <laughs> like uh, given to the Americans to for them to safeguard. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true, but and maybe that's still there, and maybe that's why the Chinese have been buying back the gold. I don't know, but uh, and there's also the story about um, the czar when his family was, they were all uh, killed in 1918, I think it was, that uh, th he had a lot of gold in the London and New York and Paris banks. And, and where is that gold gone? There's billions of do billions of dollars worth of thousands, you know, hundreds of tons of gold and silver that was shipped from USSR and all to Switzerland, to, to, uh, to, to Switzerland. The storyline is always the same: divide and conquer, divide and conquer. And when when, when there's chaos, there's looting, and uh, you know the guys that engineer these events are stand behind to benefit. You know, there's also the stories about is the Kazarians and the not even the Jewish, but that finance uh, uh, that finance Marxism and Lenin and also Mao Zedong to China. I would not be surprised. You know, the history is. As we see in the last few years, very clear that whoever wrote the histories are the victors that do. So you got to really give a grain of salt of what you read happened 10, 50 or 200 years ago. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I guess what's happening now is the people who have had control of uh, the gold and, and the system since Bretton Woods, uh, they've been challenged. And, and you, you think now we're going to get like the Wild West because there's not going to be one country in charge. But one question I have for you. 
uh, is a lot of people say, well, but America has the biggest Navy. They spent more uh, on defense than the next 14 or 10 countries yep. put together. But the same thing could have been said about the Soviet Union, maybe yep. back in 1989, 1990. And once they uh, collapsed, <laughs> their their armed forces were like uh, up for sale. Well, well, you can you don't have to go back to the 1990. You look at the Russia Ukraine war and and Putin and everybody is under the impression that the affair will be gone and over with in a matter of days. And yet a year later, here we are, and and emperors being shown to be no wear no clothes. Um, the Taiwan China situation is deliberately instigated, and uh, you know if if a rocket is fired, which is easily done. <laughs> China is, you know, one time flew up to 60 planes and a dozen aircraft, a uh, uh, dozen vessels, including two aircraft carrier, entirely engulfing the Taiwan Strait to the eastern side of Taiwan. Not, did you see anything show up uh, from the United States? No. If rockets fire and landed in Taiwan from China, either by accident or on purpose, and if 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 the United States doesn't show it, doesn't come to doesn't 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 sort of come to resolve. Then that would be, and then you know that is when the moment really sort of moment of epiphany really is that holy cow the Japanese will be thinking well <laughs> you know yeah. maybe 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 we gotta have a direct dialogue with with that's do a border right with China and Russia and 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 reaching out elsewhere because before it was just way too easy you know America's word is gold and. And uh, and and now it's like holy cow, you know, if if that war does break out and the United States is a step up to the plate, and and uh, the 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 hell really gonna break loose everywhere. You're gonna see a lot of the conflicts that had that had originated decades, centuries ago. They're they're gonna come home to roost. And one other point, you know, while there's there's a lot of cozy of China and Russia. Keep in mind that during the during the uh, early 1900s. Um, uh, and also, the, uh, and uh, and and the uh, late 1800s, you know, won the Opium War. China lost thousands of square kilometers of Manchuria, northeastern China, to Russia. So they don't have that entire engulfing area to have access to sea. And there is uh, now some talks within China about they're almost waiting eagerly, uh, like an eagle watching over just for that moment of Russia to. They're playing both. They're playing their own interest. And and if if, if 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 Russia were to all be concentrating their firepower on the Western region, I think they're making. I mean, China is eyeing back these lands. I mean, they study history, and uh, you know, it's like I said one more time, just because they have a common enemy doesn't mean they're friends at all. Interesting, and uh, you, you you said that uh, you know, like the uh, BRICS is uh, uh, there's a lot of division. It's not uniform. Different languages, and yeah, I, I've also. Uh, heard that and seen that uh, China and India, for example, they don't have a great relationship. So and they're part of BRICS. But uh, so you you think uh, Taiwan, um, because I, I've seen that Taiwan and uh, China is Taiwan's greatest uh, trading partner. So why, why would Taiwan want to like, enrage China and vice versa? Um, do you think it's being provoked by the Americans as an excuse? But if the Americans are gonna not going to step up to the plate, uh, why they're doing this? And what you said as well about if something happens vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and Taiwan, and the Americans don't do anything, uh, Japan will be uh, will be worried. That they're going to say, "Well, we need to look for say you know for new partners." Just like maybe Saudi Arabia when. Uh, the U.S. Uh, left Damn. Afghanistan in 2021. They made uh, a week later. They made an agreement with the with the Russians for uh, military cooperation. Yeah, I mean Saudis one day America they this in the OPEC one day increased production and then and then America and and then America say oh you, you don't produce too much oil with climate change and the next day they don't produce so much oil and they say you are. You are uh, you are sabotaging my economy, and you know the Saudis just have enough of it. Um, you know, I don't like to talk to politics too much, but I'm a Taiwan native. I actually spend quite a bit of my time there right now. Every government is two sides in the same coin. The only reason the uh, DPP, which is the uh, which is the uh, the government in place in Taipei, Taiwan, right now, they're they're in charge. 
only because if 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 they go back to if they if the if the country go back to the mothership, they lose their jobs. Okay, that's made no pretense about it. And the, I think that the reason the reason the you I, there's probably my guess. My, this is my speculation that the reason that, that rocket has been fired because because the uh, the uh, the guys calling the shots in Taipei and and Beijing are still yet to reach a deal. Right? They could be talking. Hey, look. If you fire a shot, and if we don't do any, if we surrender, like, if if we if we just wave the flag, what do I get out of it? What do I get out of it? You'll be surprised, uh, Mario, having studied history of how South American countries rise and fall, that how sort of how easily a government can 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 bring down, like the case of Bolivia, for example. It takes few thousand people marching into the presidential palace. With 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 with, a, with 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 few dynamites thrown at, at the police and everybody stood down and that was the end. The president didn't fly, and, and the same story is repeated in you know in, in many different countries. So uh, I would not be surprised that if if the guys are 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 under the table are sort of discussing a, a arrangement of you know what pieces go to where and who is going to own what and and who's going to occupy what post. I would not be surprised at all. Unfortunately, the guys that sacrifice are the ordinary. Gullible, uh, uh, you know, ordinary mom and pops that are uh, that that are just there. I mean, just like Ukraine again, right? Do you think Red Zelensky is really going after for the benefit of Ukrainian and and refuse to, refuse to come to the negotiating table with second largest nuclear superpower in the world? No, doesn't make any sense. And then, um, so same with situation in Taiwan. Like, why would you want to invite Pelosi to visit? And uh, why would you want to go to the United States? Like you're not achieving anything other than other than provoking, right? So I think there's a lot of different dynamics at play. Um, we just gotta wait. To, uh, we gotta wait and see. I think there's a lot of people that are that are really credible in calling for uh, calling for a you know some action to take place sooner than later. We, we just have to wait and see. The world is only going to become more unpredict unpredictable as as time go on. You also have a lot of the Europeans, the Germans, and the French are visiting China. I think by the textbook they wouldn't have done so. So clearly, while there is some national gravity uh, that will, that are that are pulling away from the the transnational agenda, so I think it's just gotta go, go country by country basis, um, Mario. Yeah, interesting yeah. about Taiwan. Uh, I mean, I, I've I've looked into history. I like uh, looking at history. I'm a student of history, and I, I know that up until the seventies or eighties, Taiwan was like a a military uh, dictatorship. And uh, yes, uh, they call it a democracy now. But uh, the other thing is China has caught up, mainland China has caught up economically quite a bit with Taiwan. Taiwan was always more prosperous up until maybe 20, 30 years ago. So what are you telling me is that what we're seeing maybe all the stories and the uh, crises and the provoca supposed provocations, these are just... Uh, the mainland Chinese and the Taiwanese negotiating. Do you, do you think uh, there's a, a, a real strong, uh, you being from Taiwan originally, there's a real strong like uh, willingness to reunite? Because after all, <laughs> uh, the Taiwan, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, you know, he was part of, he was in mainland China. It was He just fled there from the civil war. Is that what's happening now? Mario, it's it, even. I mean, you're you're saying that hey, it is one day Newcastle United, New, Newcastle United, and Manchester United fans are gonna have to get together and, and and be friends? No, <laughs> you don't know. Like I think that you know these are very polarized uh, people with different opinions. Um, however, my my point is that you're either green or you're blue. Neither 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 parties are looking after the interests of of the ordinary people. So I think the government should be focused to stay away from businesses and uh, and, and and should be and should be if, if, if on the world stage they should be they should be uh, they really should be bargaining for on behalf of national corporations with strong roots to Taiwan that are committed to the success of Taiwan, right? I mean, from that regard, then 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 I, but instead of what they're doing is politicking about. You know which side Taiwan should be on, either the Chinese side or the American side. But it, it doesn't really matter which side it is. If, if jobs are not created, if business don't thrive, 
and if the economy is not opening up and there's strict, too much restrictions in place. And you talked about Victoria 30 years ago. I don't think today is any better. I think they allow, just like UK, they allow you to go on the streets and say whatever you want. But when push comes to the shop, when they have a mandate, when they have agenda, they want to shovel onto you, they're just going to do it regardless. I mean, you know, like, can you imagine, like, I mean, Mario, if, if like, right now you're uh, a Sunuk, uh, the Rishi, pres uh, your prime minister's, I mean, clearly want to sort of move forward with the digital currency of which he has a investment in some of these technology companies. I mean, can you imagine, like, is he really going to care if, if, if 60, 70 percent of UK people go on strike and protest against this new digital currency money, you think they're going to have a change of mind? No. So in, in, instead, they're letting you argue about, you know, LBGQ, P, PQ, and then the the sort of, you know, the soap operas, but the real man things that real matters to the to the echelons, uh, that decision making has been long gone. That's my view. Yeah, so basically what you're saying, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're in China, Taiwan, the US, EU, UK, uh, the powers that be are always going to do what's best for them, and they're neglecting the public. I think that's what's happening. I mean, even I can tell clearly from just working as a company listed in, in Canada, every day is getting increasingly more difficult to do business from all, all, all aspects. The regulators are are, are very tardy in, in their responses. Um, even private corporation, many of them gone woke uh, hiding behind keyboards and, and and disappears from time to time. You can't get hold of somebody when they call them and try to chase down things, getting things done. They're just, it's a state of paralysis uh, and things are getting worse in doing business. And we'll have, now I have to file ESG, climate change. And and there's just a lot of um, overlapping departments, uh, paperwork getting shuffled around. Nobody makes a decision. It's a classic, uh, it's a classic socialism, communism style. So we'll share with you in 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 in, in, in socialist countries, uh, in some in like South America or in China, decision making is always a resort to what they call the working group, <laughs> and the working group is members of representation different uh, sections of a uh, of the government, and um, even they cannot see eye to eye from amongst themselves, and so it's incredibly difficult right now to get to getting business done, and I just don't see things get better unfortunately, Mario. Yeah, and you said that uh, in this uh, Wild West world where, you know, there isn't one power there policing like uh, John Wayne, the U.S., uh, precious metals will, be, will become much more important because I think it was Alan Greenspan who said, you know, in a world of war and uh, in a world of crisis, uh, payment is only accepted uh, in, in gold, in gold really, and maybe silver because currencies uh, like fiat currencies can be uh, frozen, can be, uh, yeah, like we've seen with uh, with this with the Russians. So with that, maybe you could uh, tell the viewers a little bit about uh, silver elephant mining and how you're trying to exploit, you know, the uh, the fundamentals for precious metals uh, with silver mining elephant. Sure, Mario. Before that, I just want to re revisit the uh, our price targets. I think last time when I was on the show six months ago, when gold is seventy hundred, silver is about just touched nineteen. I packed us go at two thousand and silver to break out twenty eight. So gold has reached that target, and and it's yet to be seen whether that uh, level can be can can uh, can be held on. But if not, then we might have a little bit slow summer, and then have another go at it in in, in September. But my target is getting upgraded. I think gold is not easily surpassed 2000 by the end of the year. And uh, a conservative target 2200, but not be surprised if uh, gold gets to 2400. A lot of that is going to depend on the um, where dollar is headed, the interest rates. I think in interest is going to assume, again, resume uh, up, up trends. Equity market, I think, is bottom. And, and right now, all of them are sitting comfortably above 200 average. So I'm, I'm not into the camp of uh, sort of Robert Kiyosaki and and the Peter Schiff that is you know it's falling down. In fact, the world's reflating, and they have this pent up demand from Asia that's just coming out of the pandemic mandate health mandates. So overall, I'm the world's reflating. I'm quite sort of neutral on. I don't think it's falling into pieces. It's reflating right now, but the gold is going to take. It, it, and I think silver is playing. It's a bit of a laggard, uh, but it's it's going to play catch up uh, because it's still sort of reeling from the equity correction and just. The crypto carnage. So silver is more speculative, and right now we're just not quite 
into that realm of speculation, but the gold to the silver ratio is gonna continue to trend down. It was almost 100 when we talked, and now it's about 80. And that thing's gonna go to probably by the end of the year, closer to 60. So if you like have a gold to ratio, gold, gold at 2,400 and a 60 gold to silver ratio, you'll be looking at, uh, you, you'll be looking at a you know, 40, $50 silver, which is my target for this year. One silver takes out $28, which I believe it will, and it would be done so in a hurry. Then uh, it will take it will get to thirty five dollar briefly, and then from there it could be anybody's guess. So I think that's overview of of where I think I see things at. The dollar will still continue to be about one hundred to one hundred and ten. Equity would be would be sort of consolidating in the current range. So very often uh, we're coming out of the woodworks. Uh, we come out of the uh, sort of the uh, the equity uh, correction uh, rack intact, and. Uh, the thesis is uh, now uh, for people that have a bit of risk appetite to looking into the mining sector because the equity market has bottomed in my in my view, and 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 even though gold is gold is near breakout to all time high and silver is kind of thirty percent, unfortunately, Mario, majority of the gold mining and, and silver mining company are still in the doldrum, twenty percent on the bottom, because of the slacks in the equity market, also the carnage from the crypto market, which shares a common set of investors with the mining equities. So, and uh, you know, you can see that, you know, it's poking out the 200 day moving average and the volume's increasing. Um, and the idea about a company like Silver Elephant is it's got about 200, it's got about 100 million ounces of silver in the ground that's been independently verified. At, at the current valuation of $20 million, you're paying 20 cents, 20 cents for an ounce of silver in the ground. Of course, the question then becomes, look, you know, how much does it cost to build the mine? How much does it cost per ounce to extract? The silver, I don't have all the answers with all the uncertainties, inflation. And, um, but the idea is the valuation is really in the eye of the beholder as that are art and science. But what I can tell you in the, in the peak of the moment, in the prior uh, silver uh, uh, tops, like when, when 2011, when silver is $50, or even in 2021, when silver went from 14 to almost $30 in two months, the value, at the top of the market, silver market, uh, when things are heated, uh, the companies are over, often being valued at a dollar an ounce. And that's exactly what silver elephant were in the previous occasions, you know, trading at close to $100 million based on the dollar per ounce valuation. So right now we're 20% from where, where, where we were and our valuation is around 20% from what we were um, only not even a year ago. So um, if you look at the chart of... Uh, one year chart, I think it's a better yeah. reflection. Oh yeah, right yeah, here. Exactly. exactly. So yeah. I think we're the high we're at about uh, about the two dollar and fifty cents, and we're now we're around fifty cents, about a, a fifth of what we were just a couple of years ago. Can you? So I think it's a good opportunity. Uh, the, the company's trading is, is is the valuation is as low as it's ever been, and I also just want to preface that there's nothing undisclosed uh, material and disclosed material information that that are negatively impacting the stock. It's just yeah. a matter of people have exhausted their patience. And, uh, you know, somebody's loss is somebody else's gain, Mario. Yeah, and uh, could you explain to the viewers uh, at what stage you are in terms of, you, right now you're just an exploration company, right. but uh, you plan to start producing, and you also have a bit of cash flow coming from a coal operation in Mongolia. Right. Um, the, the idea for silver is, we try to not get it too complicated, uh, Mario. It takes a lot of effort to put a mine into production from all aspects of putting together a team, community relationship, government permits, logistic transportation, buyer, buyers, contract deliveries, et cetera. So I think right now it's, it's key that we just uh, re, re, sort of re, reunite, rekindle the investing interest in the project uh, and then uh, you know bring the, bring the company back to a bit of fair valuation with our peers right now, which is trading quite a bit of multiple based on their valuation of per ounce in the ground. Right now we're about 20 cents. Some of the others are close to 50 or 60 cents. Um, the, the time to make a production decision or to strategic or make a strategic exit through mergers, acquisition or sales, you will be probably looked at when, when silver is, is closer to the top than where we are. So right now we're 30% from the bottom, as you said. But I think we're when, when, when silver price is closer to the top, you know, in the range of probably 40 to $50 by the end of the year. And I don't think the fact, fast lady is seen even at that time. It could go a lot higher, depending on where the gold and geopolitics and where the dollar is. We'll be looking at our exit strategy at that point in time. So we're not in a hurry to put the money into production, especially given the mobility, 
the long lead time of, of everything from permitting equipment wise. And uh, it's, it's just not the time to be hero right now. And rather it's a time to be de-risking the project. It sounded a little cliche, but that's what we're doing. You know, continue to foster community relations, complete our permitting process, complete the up updated economic studies. However, I mean, um, uh, Mario, the, we're not drilling right, right now at this point. We don't need to because the project is over 100,000 meters drilling already. There's already enough drilling to move enough ounces. So we're not an exploration story per se, but I would say we're more towards a development stage company. So that in itself carries a bit less risk because of, you don't have that exploration risk to have having to come up or betting in hope of, 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 of discovery. So we're we're beyond that stage. On the coal, it's not an emphasis for us right now. It is generating cash flow and cash flow is repatriating from Mongolia to uh, to Vancouver. Expansion of a mine is uh, is is a very complex process. I think we're quite happy with the current rate that we're doing, and I will just defer till we uh, publish our financial statements in about a few weeks' time. At that time, we have that full disclosure because I don't want to be going to the discussion of how much you're making per time, what you're selling, as we just started the operation and coal prices like silver is remaining quite volatile. Great. And uh, where where can uh, viewers, if they are interested in uh, Silver Elephant, and again, this is not financial advice. We're not telling you to buy it. You should do your due diligence. It is speculative. Uh, uh, I mean, if the silver price actually stays where it is and, and you start producing silver, uh, the value could go up quite a bit. Or if you don't start producing or the silver price goes up, the value might go up some. So uh, maybe tell the viewers uh, where the, the stock is traded and what the ticker is. Yeah, I never pound my chest and say, pull all your eggs in Silver Elephant. Even myself don't do that. It's uh, one of the most uh, challenging uh, mining, one of the most challenging business to be in. And you know, I often say that if you're a successful running a mining company, you can be successful in a lot of different things. Our website is silverelef.com, as you saw there. The ticker is E-L-E-F. Uh, on the Toronto Stock Exchange main board and over the counter is OTCQX uh, at S-I-L-E-F. And Mario, I just came out of a six month hiatus um, on Twitter because I was dedicating a lot of time in, in just, just getting the projects off the ground and, and getting the company in good shape, which is we, we are right now. We just raised a million to uh, over a million dollars for each of our companies. So there right now we're embarking on, we brought up a couple more directors on the board. Uh, you can also look me up at Twitter, at John Lee Silver Elephant, of which we, I, I have a lot of uh, analysis on the market, on the equities, on currencies, on gold and silver. So right now, you know, right now, keep looking at a bit of consolidation, but I would, I would not be surprised if gold carries through. Like yesterday, I think the cartel is trying really hard to get gold, put the lid on on the 2000, yet, uh, you know, at, at, at near closing, you see that very fierce rebound back, right? So yeah. that means that there's going to be very, it's quite strong support. Um, people are not afraid to challenge uh, the correction. And they're sticking their nose where they don't belong at the cartel sees. So it's a tough war going on. And then uh, my prediction is, is if gold can clear $2,000 and stay over 2000 by the end of April, then we can see some really very serious fireworks. You can see gold up to $30, $40 a day for consecutive days and breaching out that 2200 level, embarking on a challenging on a $2,400. And the most spectacular gain in that scenario will be silver. So watch out for silver for the next weeks. If not, you know, we can talk again in September and see where things are. <laughs> <laughs> Great, John. I, I look forward to speaking to you in, in September, maybe even before if, if we get fireworks. <laughs> Thank you, Mario. You're welcome and have, have a great day. You too.